Thank you, Dr. Shukvir Ali. That was the opening statement of both our speakers. Now for the response, that's the first response, I would like to invite Jonathan McClarty to make his first response presentation. Thank you, uh, Shabir, for that uh, very informative presentation. Now, you will recall in my opening statement, I presented and, and defended two major contentions. The first was, was uh, that Jesus was not a prophet of Islam. The second is that Jesus is God. Now, I went on to present some predictions by which we could evaluate our competing hypotheses this evening. Uh, the... Uh, first of those is that we should expect Jesus to prophesy. We should, we should expect Jesus to prophesy the coming of Muhammad if Jesus is indeed a prophet of Islam, as Shabir and uh, his Muslim companions believe. Um, and this must be preserved for us in the gospel records. We haven't yet seen any uh, demonstration that uh, that Muhammad is in fact prophesied by Jesus, much less that it's preserved for us in the Injil that we possess today, as Surah 7 verse 157 tells us. Um, we all, I also um, said that if Jesus is a prophet of Islam, we should not, we, we should, uh, if, if, that he should not make predictions concerning his impending death and resurrection in Surah 4 verse 1, uh, which would contradict Surah 4 verse 157 and 158 in the Quran. Um, and I said that Jesus um, should not identify God as his father, even in a metaphorical or allegorical or spiritual sense. And obviously I, I saw Shabir present texts where Jesus, in fact, does identify uh, God as his Father. So uh, Shabir can't use those texts because it violates what the Quran says in numerous passages, uh, for example, in Surah 518, where the Christians and Jews are saying that they are the children of God, and the Quran basically says, don't kid yourselves, you're not the children of God. Um, and if Jesus is God, on the other hand, we should expect him to make claims to be divine. And uh, I also showed that the... And that shows that he does make claims to be divine. Uh, we haven't had interaction with those just yet, but obviously it was Shabir's opening statement, so I didn't expect him to at this point. Uh, the, I also showed that the earliest followers of Jesus, uh, I, the disciples, um, understood Jesus to be divine. We had some interaction with that from uh, Shabir. So let me just say uh, through some of uh, what Shabir has uh, given us in his opening statement. Um, so he says that the, um, we need to define what is a prophet and, um, and define what we mean by God. In the Quran, Jesus is said to be a messenger, um, and, uh, and thus in the Islamic context, he, he is uh, greater than, than, a, than a prophet. Um, by prophet, I mean someone that is sent by God, and by God, I mean the greatest conceivable being, as should be already uh, given. I believe that Jesus, being the second person of the Trinity, was sent by the Father, and so in that sense, he was sent by God, and yet uh, he was in, he possesses the fullness of the divine attributes, divine essence, divine prerogatives, divine qualities in himself, and thus he is fully God, even though he was also sent by his Father, who also possesses the fullness of the divine qualities. Um, so that that's um, what I would say to that. Um, <clears throat> He, he mentioned that the Quran text that I brought up in my predictions that I made uh, do not define the essential qualities of a prophet, okay? But they do define the essential qualities for Jesus being a prophet of Islam, because the Quran tells us, okay, so Jesus was a prophet of Islam, this is what he did and said. And so if Jesus is a prophet of Islam specifically, then these predictions, in fact, follow. Uh, he mentioned that uh, the C.S. Lewis trilemma that I mentioned towards the close of my remarks only holds that Jesus really said these things. Uh, I gave arguments, um, sorry, graphical arguments for why Jesus said these things, and I will deal in, in just a moment with his evolving Christology arguments that he presented. Uh, he mentioned Mark chapter 10, uh, where we read that uh, Jesus, Jesus says, after he's been asked, uh, Good teacher, what was I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, Why do you ask? Uh, why do you call me good? For no, there was no one that's good but God alone. And really what Jesus is doing here is he's encouraging the rich young ruler who approached him to consider the implications of his statement. And in fact, he is, he is basically trying to redirect his attention from trying to define himself as good by uh, his own standards to, defining, uh, to, to measuring himself by God's standards. Um, and so Jesus says, no one is good but God alone. In John 10, he calls himself the good shepherd. And so if God, Jesus says only God is good, 
John 10, he says he is good, then that implies that Jesus is in fact God. Now what about this evolution of Christology argument that should be presented? Uh, you can also find examples going the other direction. The two can play this game. For example, in Luke 23, 47, we read uh, the centurion, when he sees Jesus die upon the cross, he says, surely this was a righteous man. Um, but uh, then you look at Mark's account, and it says, surely this was the Son of God. So you have Mark actually is more emphatic on the identity of Jesus than Luke. Luke just says he's a righteous man, Mark says that he is the Son of God. Uh, we also have in the trial narrative, uh, Jesus is asked by the high priest, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And he says, I am in Mark. And you will see the Son of Man sit at the right hand of power and come in the clouds of heaven. But what does he say in uh, it, it, what, what does he say in the Matthew and Luke's account? He says, "You say that I am." So it's actually more emphatic in Mark than it is in Matthew or Luke. There's another incident in Mark chapter nine where uh, Jesus heals uh, a boy that's possessed by a demon, and in uh, Mark's account, um, I, 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 people actually say that he's dead, and so it actually looks like a greater miracle than it does in. In Luke's account, in Luke chapter 9, in the parallel account, where he, it doesn't look like he's dead, he just foamed at the mouth. And so you have just you have kind of examples, and so two can play this game. Moreover, I gave an example for Matthew 11 and Luke 7, which is Q material, which makes Christ out to be Yahweh. That's even earlier than Mark. Uh, you know, what is common to Matthew and Luke, but not Mark, is earlier uh, still. So, uh, and, and you could also look at Mark's account to look at the elevated Christology in Mark. For example, in Mark chapter 1, Verses 2 and 3, it says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and then it quotes from Isaiah 40, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for Yahweh, make his path straight. As, and then it says, then John appeared, baptizing, and then he said, um, he comes to baptism, forgiving his sins, and he said, after me comes he who is mightier than I, whose um, sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. So the one he's preparing the way for is identified thus as none other than Yahweh. Uh, so you have Mark affirming the deity of Christ, you have Q material affirming the deity of Christ, you have Paul, which is uh, according to uh, Shabir's uh, construction earlier, even in all the Gospels, and I showed in my opening statement, he affirms the deity of Christ, I also showed, uh, from, for example, the Corman Christi in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, where he quotes what many, Christians, what, what many scholars take to be an early Christian hymn, and uh, makes Christ out to be God himself, and that is, uh, many scholars take even in the 30s AD, uh, so th that's very early material. So all our earliest sources actually do it from the deity of Christ. So I think Shapiro is completely off base on, on this particular point. Um, uh, we also had um, Shapiro mention that uh, Jesus uh, quotes the Shema in Mark chapter 12. The problem is that if he continued reading in verse 35 to 37, it continues where uh, Jesus um, says, that, well, Jesus says, well, Jesus was teaching in the temple courts. He asked, why do teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David, David himself, speaking enough by the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, how then can he be his son? The Lord's prayer listened to him with delight. So here, Jesus identifies the Lord of Psalm 110, seated at Yahweh's right hand as the Messiah. And so since Christians and Muslims all agree that Jesus, in fact, is the Jewish Messiah, we can agree that Jesus thus asserts himself to be the Lord of Psalm 110, seated at Yahweh's right hand. The Hebrew word used for my Lord in verse 1 is Adoni, the possessive form of Adon. Now this isn't necessarily a, a title of deity, um, as it can be used of individuals who are not God. However, in verses 5 through 7 of Psalm 110, we read, Adonai is at your right hand, that can only be ever used of Yahweh, of God himself. I don't know, at your right hand, he will crush kings when they was wrapped. He will judge the nations, heaping up, and up the dead, and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook along the way, and so he will lift his head high. So, in, in, in the Hebrew, verse 5 does indeed identify the one seated at Yahweh's right hand is none other than Adonai, the word is only a verb deity. Um, and so, Psalm 110 implies a plurality of divine persons within the Godhead. Now, one might respond and say that the Masoretic bowl pointing that distinguishes those two terms evolved centuries later. Um, so it's not, it's, it's, it might be a little more ambiguous in the original um, writing. But how then can we tighten this argument? In Psalm 16, verse 2, we read, I say to the Lord, you are, you are my Lord, apart from uh, you I have, no, I, I have no good thing. In Psalm 35, 23, we read, Awake and rise to my defense, contend for me, my God and my Lord. So clearly David's Lord in those texts is God himself. Yet without the later Masoretic vowel pointing, these texts are indistinguishable from Psalm 
If, um, if one accepts the Masoretic Ball pointing in regards to verse 1, then one must be consistent and accept it in regards to verse 5, in which the one seated at Yahweh's right hand is identified as Adonai. Now, in our text in Mark 12, Jesus makes the argument in verse 37 that David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? The point he's making is that none of David's descendants could be greater than David. This then cannot be referring to David's son, and so the question that is thus raised is what sort of Lord this could be referring to. Now, but we can go even further than that, um, because David's um, Lord cannot be even a human king, because in Psalm 2, all kings are said to be subject to David. And Psalm 89 uh, tells us that I will appoint him as David to be my first lord, and was exalted of the kings of the earth. And so it cannot be mere, and it also cannot be mere angelic creatures, since angels serve God's elect and are servants at themselves. And so who, who is left? That would be God. And so thus Psalm 110, 1 is a powerful proof text for two divine persons. Um, and moreover, David's Lord is said to be sitting at God's right hand, but where is God's throne? Uh, Psalm 2, verse 4 says, The one enthroned in heaven laughs, the Lord scoffs at them. Psalm 11, verse 4, the Lord is, at, uh, is in his holy temple, the Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth, his eyes examine them. Psalm 103, 19 tells us the Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. So that thus, if Yahweh is enthroned in heaven, then David's Lord must be seated in heaven as well. And so this presents even further difficulties for Islam. For instance, in Surah 380 of the Qur'an, he reads, Nor could he order you to take the angels and prophets as lords. Would he order you to disbelieve after you had been Muslims? And so thus, um, how could David and Jesus be Muslims if David worshipped Messiah as his lord, as speaks to him, as being seated on the throne of God himself? Um, See, um, Shabir asks, how can we say that God died? Because obviously we say that Jesus died. How can we say that uh, God, Jesus being God died? Because we know that God is immortal. Um, I would actually maintain, I mean, Abraham is monotheist. Neither Shabir nor myself believes that death is a cessation of existence. Uh, we, we don't believe death is a cessation of existence. We believe that you know, when we die, there's body separates from the soul, and the soul goes into the afterlife. Um, we, uh, I believe that when Jesus died, the, 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 the soul departed from his body went into Hades as he said to the thief on the cross I tell you the truth this day will be with me in paradise um, so just in summary then I, I don't think that I, sh um, I, I don't find the arguments that Shabir presented very compelling for the, for, for the prophetic credentials of Jesus and not the deity. thank you found in the Christian Bibles at the time when the Quran was saying that, or even now. However, it is clear that uh, when Jesus spoke about the paraclete, Jesus was actually speaking about someone to come after himself. Not the way in which it is represented in the Bibles now, but when Jesus originally said this. Let me explain. Uh, Jesus' statements about the paraclete are found in John chapter 14, 15, and 16. In John chapter 14, it's clearly saying that the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, verse number 26. In John chapter 16, however, if we, if we didn't keep John 14 in mind, it's looking like Jesus is speaking about a human being to come after himself. Christian scholars have belabored this. Often, uh, the, the gospel commentaries will go verse by verse, verse by verse. Then at the end of the commentary, they have an appendix to explain what is the paraclete. Why the appendix? Because the paraclete is one of the most difficult things to explain in John's gospel. It needs a separate treatment. Uh, uh, Raymond Brown, in his uh, treatment of this, says that uh, uh, John's gospel went through many stages of editing. And uh, these different statements about the paraclete represent different stages of editing. 
uh, John, in, in the final stage, wants to uh, make Jesus come back as the Holy Spirit into the uh, lives of believers after his predicted coming in the flesh failed. So Jesus was expected to come back in the lifetime of his disciples. It didn't look like he was coming back. And then eventually John's solution was this. Say that Jesus has come back and he is a spirit being in the hearts of the believers. Problem solved. In which case, it looks to me that what John has done here is that he has taken statements about a human being to come after Jesus and styled that into statements about a Holy Spirit to come into the lives and the hearts of believers as Jesus himself. And that's why the statements read as they are now with the Johannian Christology all uh, bleeding through it so that John, uh, uh, Jonathan can say, oh look, Jesus is sending uh, the paraclete. So is he God to send the paraclete? Uh, okay, the paraclete will be with you forever. So will Muhammad be with you forever? Uh, it, it, I, I agree that the way in which John has styled it now, it doesn't uh, look on the surface like it's referring to a human being and to the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. But when we trace the history back and we try to ascertain well, how did the paraclete statements come to be like they are, as they are now in the Gospel according to John, then we can see that John was actually, Jesus was actually speaking about a human being before John turned some of the statements, more than others, uh, to make it look like a Holy Spirit coming uh, after Jesus. Now, think about it this way. Suppose uh, Jesus spoke about the Holy Spirit. Why would some of the statements be turned to make it look like a human being? But, on the other hand, if Jesus uh, spoke about a human being, another prophet to come after him, why would the statements be turned to make it look like the Holy Spirit? Simple. Because that's how the church evolved. They wanted Jesus to be the be-all and end-all. No other prophet to come after him. So grace and truth before Jesus. Uh, so law, law and judgment before Jesus. Grace and truth in Jesus. Uh, God used to send his prophets. Now he sent his son. So for, for the writers of the New Testament, Jesus is the be-all and end-all. There's no other prophet to come. But we are finding traces in the Gospels uh, and in the rest of the New Testament that other prophets uh, did exist and more prophets could come. So there's no final prophet in, in the New Testament. Uh, and Jesus gave a, a directive. How do you know a true prophet from a false one? By their fruits. Why this directive? He could have just said, anybody who comes after me and claims to be a prophet is a false prophet. If everyone is a false prophet after him. But if he's giving a criterion by which to differentiate between true and false, that means there's a possible true one. And uh, Jonathan spoke about John the Baptist, but I don't think he put all the statements of the New Testament together. John the Baptist said, after me will come one who's, uh, who's so great, who's greater than I am. Okay? And Jesus says, of all of those born of women, there has arisen none greater than John the Baptist. So it's clear that John the Baptist is greater than Jesus. And John the Baptist speaks about somebody to come after him who is greater than John the Baptist. So put it all together. If A is greater than B and B is greater than C, then A is greater than C. And A is not equal to C. I mean, this is very clear. So if B is for Baptist and C is for Christ, then Baptist is greater than, than Christ. And if A is for Ahmed, then Ahmed is greater than Baptist and Baptist is greater than Christ. A is greater than Christ. It's a simple uh, formula. Uh, now, uh, to uh, continue, uh, Jonathan made much of the Son of Man uh, statements. Uh, but uh, think about this. If Jesus wanted to say that he is God, why would he go around saying, I am the Son of Man? I agree with James Dunn and many other scholars who say that, that the, the, the mention of Son of Man must have gone back to Jesus. But I also agree with uh, Bruce Chilton, rather, I'm not, you know, who am I to say I agree or not? But I, I have to respect these scholars and, and follow their, their uh, line of reasoning here. Bruce Chilton uh, has, has shown in his article in Bible Review magazine uh, that uh, there are three categories of statements uh, regarding the Son of Man from the lips of Jesus. Sometimes he speaks about himself, and in one of these categories he's speaking about a future, in their terms, apocalyptic Son of Man, a figure to come in the future. And that future figure is not Jesus. According to Bruce Chilton, when the statements are looked at very carefully, because Jesus speaks about that other person in the third person as someone else other than Jesus. And so, and whoever is that son of man, whether the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him or somebody else, and that remains to be discussed. But, it, clearly, according to the scholar, it is not Jesus. 
Moreover, if we make so much of this statement because there's this figure in heaven and he's of such an exalted status, now naturally you've got to say, well, Muhammad is not of that exalted status. Muhammad is a slave and servant of God, and Muslims uh, probably say that. Uh, but we must realize that uh, in, the, uh, in, in the period, uh, the few hundred years uh, before Christianity, in the time when the book of Daniel was written, uh, some Jews began to think of a second power in heaven. And the Jewish rabbis railed against, railed against this, calling it a heresy. A book about this uh, is entitled Two Powers in Heaven by Alan Segal. And uh, so, so we, we have a statement, some of which Jonathan probably cited, like Psalms 110 uh, and so on, would speak of, would speak of an exalted figure, uh, someone sitting on the throne uh, beside God. So now like, we have two powers in heaven. But this is a heresy that has been uh, written back into the, the, well, the Psalms or other writings in the Old Testament, and uh, that's part of what led Christians to think of Jesus as being an exalted figure, because they already had in mind from reading the Old Testament that there is some exalted figure apart from, from God. But the Son of Man, back to him for a moment, in Daniel it is very clear that there is one called the Ancient of Days, and there is another one called the Son of Man, and the Son of Man, great as he is, is not as great as the Ancient of Days. He is subject to the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days in this scenario obviously is the one true God. Or if you want two gods, well, okay, include the Son of Man as well, but admit that you have two powers in heaven and you've fallen into the heresy uh, which Alan Segal spoke about. And of course, the Quran says, They are following the statements of those who disbelieved of old. The Quran actually already like, laid bare the whole uh, scenario of Christian history and how Christians fell into this. And so, it, it, Jonathan needs to be careful before um, uh, falling into uh, that heresy. So, when he speaks about Malachi and a messenger to come, uh, and then that uh, messenger obviously is uh, 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 John the Baptist to uh, come as a forerunner, and then Jesus comes, and Jesus is the Lord, and so on. All of this is uh, part of that whole two powers heresy. But if you uh, then trace the the narratives very closely, you will see that the New Testament writers are not using the Old Testament in the way that we expect. Like we expect there should be equivalence. We get out our dictionary, does that word mean this, and so on. That's not how the New Testament writers wrote. The New Testament writers practiced uh, Jewish ways of interpreting Bible. They pra practiced Midrash and Pesher. They were not interested so much on equivalence, they were interested in what does this remind me of? Almost like you saw me a crossword puzzle where, you know, the clue is to some word that is not really a dictionary meaning of the word, but it's somewhere close and that's good enough for the puzzle. Uh, so what they have done is sometimes they made equivalents where equivalents did not exist. For example, Matthew's Gospel uh, says that when the baby Jesus was, caught, was brought back out of Egypt, that fulfills what God said in Hosea, out of Egypt I called my son. But in Hosea, the son that was spoken about there was Israel as a nation on the whole that came out of Egypt uh, out under, from under the domination of the Pharaoh. So Matthew uh, equated two things. Now you might have to say then, so that means in Matthew's mind, Jesus is Israel. No, it's not in Matthew's mind. What Matthew is doing is he's practicing Jewish ways of interpreting the Bible. It's not our way, and we don't follow that. We don't see it, but he saw it. So when Matthew uh, says, for example, that uh, this uh, is the scenario here, John the Baptist is the forerunner of Jesus, and then they start citing passages from the Old Testament which make it look like Jesus is Yahweh, it's not in their mind that Jesus is Yahweh. It's very clear. Matthew, for example, in chapter 12, verse 18, has Jesus speak uh, the words which show that Jesus is the servant of Yahweh. So this is very clear in, in, in among these uh, writers. Now, Jonathan says that when Jesus said, uh, no one is good but God alone, he wanted the person to think that he is God. But no, that's a very strange scenario. And if, if that's what Mark wanted, uh, uh, that, if that's what is clear from the Mark's narrative, why did Matthew change it? And he's saying, no, Matthew didn't change. Look at all the uh, exceptions to that grand scenario. That grand scenario showing that it's Matthew and Luke who are doing the later changes, this has been pieced together by scholars after many hundreds of years. And uh, conservative scholars resisted it for a long time, uh, but nowadays it's some conservative, many conservative scholars actually uh, agree. He mentioned in his presentation Robert Gundry, he agrees. Uh, Matthew copies from Mark and changes. 
Uh, uh, he mentioned uh, James Dunn. James Dunn also agrees. I have mentioned several others. Bruce Metzger, uh, uh, F.F. Uh, F. F. Bruce. Uh, the, the scholars are numerous. They resisted it for a while because they saw the implications. They saw that that means that you know everything becomes loose once you recognize that this is happening, and they try to keep everything together. But after a while, they have come to recognize that this is what is happening. Matthew is changing the story, and so too is Luke and John. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we move on to the second response. For the second response, I invite again Jonathan to come forward, please. Thank you again, uh, Shabir, for another uh, engaging uh, response. Uh, you recall in my opening statement, I presented a number of lines of argument to support uh, my contention that Jesus, in fact, is God and not the prophet of Islam. Uh, the first of those is that Jesus is not prophet Simon Muhammad, contradicting the Quran. Uh, Jesus' statements regarding his impending death and resurrection also contradict the Quran. Jesus' statements regarding his self identity, uh, the beliefs of Jesus' earliest followers, are part of the explanation. So let me just uh, look at how Shabir has responded with the case presented thus far. So, and. Um, we, he, he tells us that the Quran does not say if um, a specific statement of Jesus concerning Muhammad is found in the current Gospels. But it does say in Surah 7 verse 157, this is about uh, Jesus uh, predicting Muhammad, it does say in Surah 7 verse 157 that the people of the book, namely the Christians, um, and indeed the Jews, are able to find about Muhammad written in their scriptures, namely in the case of the Jews, the Torah, and in the case of the Christians, the Injil, the good news, the Gospel. Uh, unfortunately for Muslims, we can't find them. And uh, Shabir says that the, the paraclete here, that the text in John 14 and John 16, uh, is not, uh, uh, is, he's not, it, it, the Quran is not talking about the way that the, it's represented in the Gospels now, but rather in the way that Jesus originally said this. And I would like Shabir to explain to me, Surah 7 verse 157, which says that we can actually go and read about Muhammad in the Injil, potentially find him in the book which is between their hands, is what the Arabic actually means. That it's between their hands, they actually have it in, pos in their possession. Um, and if we can't find it in the Quran, with the, in, the, in the New Testament, which is in our possession, because we have exactly what they had back then, we have the Codex Anianthius, which is the entire New Testament, which predates the Quran by 300 years. So if they had the Injil then, then we certainly have it now. Now, um, and, and again, he didn't engage with any of my argumentation concerning the Paraclete texts. Uh, he didn't uh, try to explain to me why he's not guilty of shirk. Uh, because in John 16, we have Jesus, in fact, sending the, the, the messenger, the, the, or the, the helper, um, after him. Uh, we have Jesus sends the helper, and according to Islam, Allah is the one who sends prophets. Uh, so you have to commit shirk. And also in John 14, he indwells all believers, and so he's omnipresent. These are attributes of the divine, not attributes of a prophet. And he also didn't meet the disciples, which uh, is, is problematic as well. He said in Matthew 11, uh, Jesus says that none has risen greater um, anyone than John the Baptist. Uh, there's a problem there, because if you can read the whole of, of Matthew, even in the immediate context, you can see why he was wrong. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 through 14, for example, we read, this is the same gospel, I baptize, John the Baptist speaking, I baptize you with the water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to, to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his sweet into the barn and burning the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to be baptized by John, but John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Um, also in John 1, um, John testifies concerning him. He, cri he cries out, saying, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Um, now, if, if, if we read in... Uh, in um, Matthew 11, which is the same uh, passage, we, if, you, if you just continue reading, he says, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. This is immediately after the text that should be alluded to. Um, but then we, we read in, in, the, in, in the Gospel of Matthew uh, that Jesus is the king of that kingdom. In Matthew 7, for example, he's the judge. It says in Matthew 16, for the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father and and, and, then, and then he will repay um, every man for what he has done. So if it's his kingdom, then 
and, and that he who is least in the kingdom of God is, is greater than John the Baptist, that makes Jesus much superior to John the Baptist. Uh, point refuted. Also, um, uh, notice that he said uh, that the Son of Man figure is an eschatological figure. Uh, the problem with that uh, rejoinder is, because um, he, he argues that the Son of Man doesn't actually refer to Jesus himself, it's not his self designation, he's referring to some eschatological or apocalyptic figure to come after him. The problem is that in, in Mark chapter 12, which is just two chapters earlier than chapter 14, which is the trial narrative where Jesus identifies as the Son of God, we actually have an allusion to um, Psalm 110, where he identifies the Messiah, the Christ, as the one seated at Yahweh's right hand. Mark 14 identifies the Son of Man as the one seated at Yahweh's right hand. So if, if, if the Messiah, which everyone here accepts, is Christ, is Jesus Christ, and Jesus tells us that the Messiah is seated at the right hand of Yahweh, and in Mark 14 he tells the Son of Man is seated at the right hand of Yahweh, that presents a major problem. And also, in, uh, in Matthew 19, 28, and Luke 22, 30, this is a few sayings, this is common to Matthew and Luke absent from Mark, this was early material, Jesus actually says that, uh, that the, 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 the Son of Man will reign on his glorious throne, and the disciples will be judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, where is Jesus' throne? He is the Son of Man, that's his throne. So that, again, suggests that we're dealing with Jesus being the Son of Man in Jesus' self-understanding. And in fact, again, I, I want to stress concerning the Son of Man text in Daniel 7, 13, 14, he receives, according to the Greeks of Septuagint, the true, the very highest form of worship or religious service. That's what the New Testament Christians use, the Septuagint version. And in the Aramaic, he receives Pelach, a type of religious service only ascribed to Yahweh. Again, it suggests a plurality of divine persons in the Godhead, and suggests that Jesus considered himself to be God, not a prophet of Islam. Thank you very much. Jonathan is helping me here to do well, right? Thank you. It's good to that. That's because we're not here as Batman versus Superman. We're, we're here to uh, understand the truth, right? So, uh, whether it comes from me or it comes from Jonathan, we're all the better for knowing what it is. So, oh, sorry, I should have started my timer. Um, I count what I said as part of my time, so um, not to cheat here. Uh, so, uh, to my final response, uh, Jonathan uh, continues to say that, uh, well, that Jesus sends uh, this person, and that person, and so on, must be forever. So, did, did Shabir uh, avoid committing shirk here? You will recall that I actually addressed this point. Uh, Jonathan is going by the way the words read right now. And I'm going by uh, what might have been the words as were originally spoken by Jesus. The words that were originally spoken by Jesus probably uh, were uh, what would agree with an Islamic ethos. The words as they are now are what John presents. Uh, and, and who is this John? We don't really know. Because uh, as uh, Tom Wright uh, said, uh, we don't really know if it was John who wrote it and if John, which John. And uh, uh, conservative uh, Christian scholars such as him are admitting that we have a problem there with the identity of the, of the writers. Uh, Jonathan said that, uh, look at some examples where uh, Luke and Matthew have improved, uh, uh, sorry, where it's the other way around. Mark seems to have improved Luke and Matthew. Well, the scholars who dealt with this said that it may be uh, that uh, since it is so clear that Matthew and Luke generally improve over Mark, and there are these few exceptions, these exceptions may be because uh, what Mark and Matthew, what, 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 what Matthew and Luke used was an earlier version of Mark, which we no longer have. So the Mark we have, they said, is an improved version of the Mark which Matthew and Luke were using. So they speak of a, of a uh, or Marcus, a source of the present Mark's Gospel. So that's how the scholars explain this. And as I said, there's a, they're conservative scholars. They're not Muslim scholars, and they're not liberal Christian scholars. There are those too, but uh, there are many conservative scholars whose names I've mentioned, and they have dealt with this in great depth. 
And the, the most detailed treatment uh, is by Robert Stein uh, in his book, The Synoptic Problem. I would recommend that you read that book. Now he asked us, okay, uh, where in, in the, the, the New Testament and the Old Testament does it say uh, that, uh, that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is going to come uh, to fulfill what the Quran says in Surah 7, verse 157? Notice what it says in Surah 4, uh, 7, 157. Uh, the one whom they will find written among them in the Torah and the Injil. It's they who will find it. It's not saying that Muslims will find it, because Muslims don't know how to read the Old and New Testaments. Muslims don't know the methods of Jewish and Christian interpretation, Midrash, Pesher, Allegory, and Typology. But if Christians and Jews have read, read their scriptures in this way, using all of these methods of interpretation to find figures and predict futures and seeing that the one who is here and they say, ah, oh, yeah, this is the guy who was mentioned previously, uh, like uh, Jesus coming out of Egypt, that fulfills Hosea, and so on. So if they use their methods, they should find that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is mentioned in their books as well. So the question is, why stop with the prophets that they stop with? Uh, how do we know among Jews that they have had the last prophet? How do we know among Christians that they have had the last uh, prophet? That's the Quran's uh, point. It's not saying that it's written the way that Jonathan wants to see it today and I want to see it today. We are, we are interpreting the different methods and I believe that our methods are correct. But the Quran here is using an argument against them. If that's the method that you, those are the method, methods you use, why do you fail to see the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Now, he points to Matthew chapter 3, where um, John the Baptist uh, speaks, yes, about one coming greater, uh, uh, after him greater than himself, and he says, oh, but look, Matthew also shows that, uh, uh, that Jesus is greater than John the Baptist, look at the baptism scene. But remember his criterion of embarrassment? That's how we know when uh, one of the narratives about Jesus is not really authentic. Well, Christian scholars themselves, using that criterion, they say that that baptism scene is not correctly described in Matthew. Matthew has actually uh, changed the story to make it look that Jesus is superior to John the Baptist, but the original story, as it was in Mark's Gospel, would make it look like John the Baptist was superior. Uh, because Mark's Gospel says that uh, John the Baptist was preaching a, a baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And people were coming to him, obviously, to get their sins forgiven. And Jesus also came, which now raises the question, was he coming to get some of his sins forgiven? Uh, and uh, so, uh, the other writers, all of them, after Mark, have tried to modify the story one way or another to get rid of that embarrassment. And Matthew has done it best, well, one of the best ways. John has probably actually trumped this uh, again, the American uh, elections. Uh, uh, so... And John has done it better by showing that when Jesus appeared at the baptism scene, there's no description of the baptism, but John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So this is actually the, the best that they can be, as if there is a preordained plan for Jesus to come and die for the sins of the world. So later, invented story, it's in the last uh, gospel. So, uh, in, in short, it is very clear that uh, the points I presented uh, show that uh, Jesus uh, is a prophet of God, both according to the Quran and the Bible, and uh, Jesus is not God. And think about the logic. If Jesus was God, then something like the Trinity would have to be correct, but the Trinity is not correct. Thank you very much.